And then once you're in the mix window, all you have to do is go to the insert dropdown. I want you to notice something. There are two main options here in this insert dropdown. What do you see? No, because you're too far already. Go back a stage. Right, right. Plugins and IOs. Now, you guys went just one level too far, and that's fine. Uh, but look at this. This is huge because most people skip this. Notice it says plugin and IO. The IO gives you the option to physically route, and this is what the book is talking about, to any IO that you have optional on yours. And your list isn't as long as this one, but, but you should have optional IO listed out if you go to IO. What this really does and what it is, is it will give you a path that will send out of whatever channel you select, it'll send out that channel, and it'll return it back to that channel coming back in. And the beauty of that is, is that means that now you can connect any physical uh, effects unit or anything you'd like to route anything through in the middle of the chain. So instead of being stuck in the box with processing, we want to process any one channel down any one thing that's outside of our computer. We get to do that right here. And it's actually fairly simple. Um, a great example of this, uh, you could just use like a distortion pedal to do some distorted vocals or something. You want to get kind of a gritty sound. Just write it, uh, send to analog three, it's going to go out of output three and it's going to return back to input three. All in one thing, and essentially all it's going to look like for you on the plugin side is this. It's just going to say analog three, It'll say what track it's assigned to you and what grouping. And that's it. Now, the real big benefit of this is that a lot of people, um, a lot of people in larger studio setups find that plugins um, just don't get the sound that they're looking for. So a lot of uh, more expensive outboard gear is needed. If any of you have ever been to at Odds On, you see that whole rack full of stuff. A lot of studios have a lot of outboard gear, a lot of physical things that have a classic sound. A lot of them are usually tube, or maybe they're still, still solid state, but they're class A wired stuff that you can't necessarily manipulate or refabricate in the box. So they don't worry about that. They just set up a routing for out-of-the-box processing that they can physically send in range to and get returned to in the box. Now, the way that that really works, the way that that's beneficial, because you're probably sitting there wondering, well, if it's out of the box, then how do I program it? Or if it's out of the box, then how do I save the data or the settings for it? A lot of times, people, what they'll do is, they'll route out of the box, and once they get the sound set up they want, they'll put it to print, basically re-record it into Pro Tools, so that they don't have to physically process in real time anymore out of the box. Does that make sense? So they'll actually print the physical stem down, Unless they actually just take notes and, and write recall sheets for everything, and that's how they want to do things. Um, so there's really those two different options. But um, that brings me to this. Because maybe you're wondering, well, how does that really work out? Because obviously, in order to re-record it back, we have to send the output back out to something and then bring it back in. Yada, yada, yada. And all, and all those things. And this is what I would like to highlight uh, as well. Notice, if you go down below to Sends and hit that drop-down list, notice what it has as your options. First category is Output. Any output you, you desire. And, and those output categories essentially list all of your outputs that are available for you on your particular unit. And so you can actually route your Sends out any output, any physical output, and then of course return them to a different track if you'd like. So sometimes, let's just say, a couple of scenarios, let's say you have a reverb unit in the box, okay? But then you have a really nice one out of the box, and you'd rather switch to your out of the box version. All you end up having to do is you could keep your busing system the way that it is. Well, let me just show you how this will work out. Let's say that, um, let's see. I'm just gonna build an aux input real quick. And I'm just going to pretend this is a, a reverb. There's two ways to do this. One way is you could send this send to a specific bus, bus 1, for example. And you could call the input of this aux 
Boss one, for example, give it a little game, which is an option click thing. And then on the insert, you could physically wrap this to an external device so that this is the reverb plugin and it still gets bussed down to this output. Last to time. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't get that last time. I just don't get that. When you're, when you're sending through the insert? Yes. I, that doesn't make sense at all. So, sorry. I'm listening. I'm just like, ah. Oh. The, okay, this, the insert send, I'm trying to think if I have any physical things in the cabinet that I can do this with. Um, I may not have any any uh, cabling for it either because it takes, with the 003, it takes some turnarounds to make this work. Overview of career services. <laughs> to access the career services area, click the career services report, my career tab, along the top, uh, on the home page of the uh, school portal. Devices there. Um, oh, you know what? When we take a break, I'll run upstairs and I'll go grab the Avalon. And I'll bring the Avalon down here for you to see how we would route in and out of the Avalon from something that's already been recorded. The way this particularly works is in this in the insert section, you normally have plugins, which are virtual, correct? So you normally have virtual plugins that are um, essentially replicas or makeups of what it would be in the analog world of a device, right? So reverb, compressors, EQs. This will actually give you the ability to use a physical one. And if you look at and, and just uh, close your eyes because the light's coming on. Um, if you were to stand up, or actually most of you can turn around. Uh, except for, uh, you can actually look at mine back there. Um, turn around and look at the interface behind you. The interface behind you, you should notice, has main outputs of some sort, and then it has outputs that say numbers, at least, I think on these it's just one through six. And on the one back in the back, it's one through eight. Do you see that? On the Inbox Pro, it says outputs one through six. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you have your inputs. Guys, do you see this back here? Yeah. They're, they're grouped in a weird section there, so they're all together. Yeah. Yeah, you see them all together in that blank spot in the middle? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So there, on that, where it says analog three, if I selected analog three there, what it's going to do is it's going to route out of the output number three. So you see it physically go out of the output number three. Now, what's going to happen is it's going to go to some external device. Let's say it's just an EQ, single rack EQ. EQ all day, right? And all it's going to do is it's going to process through that EQ and it's going to fire back out and it's going to, by default, expect it to return to input three. Okay. And so if you look and find input three on there, input three is where you would return it in order to make that complete loop. It's really a simple process here. Um, and, and when I was in college, they didn't have it set up like this. We had to like, in order to do this, you had to route it out an output and then you had to make a new input, an aux input separately for it. And, and it kind of, it wasn't as easy as this back in the day, but that was in, especially in my day, you couldn't find an EQ that sounded great in the box. And, and every time you got, they had Bomb Factories even when I was in college, the Bomb Factory 1176, and it sounded like crap. It just didn't work, it, it was very muddy, it was just gross. So we'd go, well, we have physical compressors, let's run through that. So we'd sit around and go, how do we do it? You know, how do we make that work? And there was all this work attached to it, Nowadays, it looks like that, and all it is is a simple in and out kind of thing. You don't have to uh, basically manipulate your tracks to try to send that way. So you can, kind of, you can see the benefit with this, especially for people who, and in my opinion, it's the best way to go, people who invest in outboard gear. And the reason I think that outboard gear is a good investment is because most of outboard gear, if you buy, if, let's say you spend on an external device, you spend 500 bucks or more on an external device, more than likely, in the next 10 years, if, it's, if it has a digital interface, in the next 10 years, it'll probably go down to half its value, but if it's physically analog, if almost all of it is analog with no digital components, 
it actually keeps its value or it will appreciate. Most of the physical devices that you see that are at odds on are, are were worth several hundred dollars in their day. You know, were literally worth less than five hundred dollars in their day. Most of which value over a thousand dollars now. You know, uh, and that's because their physical hardware that just sounds hand, hand down better than what we can do with a box. And a lot of it has to do with saturation. A lot of it has to do with the fact that how the um, how the actual unit physically responds to the drive of an input is just invariably hard to just capture with a plug-in because you're changing your levels uh, on the plug-in stage by really manipulating the information that's already converted to I basically ones and zeros, you know, into the uh, digital version of what they would be. In the analog world, it's literally voltage, and that voltage essentially pushes or drives the mechanics of how the information is processed on a physically analog device. So, did that answer your question? In terms yeah. Of, yeah. Okay. Does everybody else get this? It's, I mean, I know that right now it's kind of conceptual. I'll go get a device that I can show it to you with because then you'll see how this works out and why it's nice. Um, I would encourage you as soon as you possibly take Audio 225 and you clear it, to jump into Audio 265. Um, that is a beneficial course in terms of understanding some of this because all, almost all that class is, is routing things externally. Uh, in the box is fantastic because you can pick it up and take it with you, but in the box misses certain things uh, like some of the bigger picture contours to how audio really correlates with uh, other audio in the big picture. In Pro Tools, because everything's digital, and because everything's uh, specifically put on different DSP cards, uh, or I should say, they're assigned to specific DSP cards that we max out on. As soon as we overload our plugins in Pro Tools and the in the box, our system tends to be less responsive, and it does not calculate 100% for every value the way that it would if we put it all output it to analog. Does that make sense? Yeah. Be, just because of the overload, when you get into 70 something tracks or more, all of a sudden putting even one single type of processing on each channel, even if it, even if on one channel it's just an EQ, on another channel it's some compression, on another channel, I mean it, eventually it just adds up to a, a, an initial system slowness, but at the end of the day, the more it compounds, it gets to be a system unresponsiveness, you know, a lack of response from the system. The uh, downside to it is, imagine you taking on a mix that has 60 something tracks, okay? And imagine you add dynamic processing to the majority of it and you're so close and you make a nice finalized copy, you bounce it down, you go to your car, you listen to it and you're like, yes, this thing sounds fantastic. And the only thing it needs is a little more vocal effects. Or maybe it just needs this little, you know, icing on the cake here just to really seal the deal. So you go to your computer, you begin to add this extra processing. Before you know it, your computer stops working, essentially. And that's the problem with it is it's just one of those things where you kind of like a system that, that you feel like you could do anything with and do as much processing as you want. And, and literally be wiring everything up at, to your ears to the point where you can do anything you want instead of feeling like if I go too far, I, I may not even be able to make a bounce out or make a finalized uh, pass through, unfortunately. I mean, doesn't that go back to just processing power of your computer? And don't they make computers that are good enough to handle anything? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. They do, but if you're not willing to spend six to ten thousand dollars on them, well, it's that versus however much all the upwork here would cost, or how much time you need in odds on. Well, oh, and that's the big thing. That's the big thing. Time and odds on, like that's a that's a big thing. Studio time is if you are specifically if you're an engineer. Studio time is not necessarily equivalent equivalent to what uh, what it would be in the in the uh, consumer world. As an engineer, does that make sense? Uh, being on the inside, you'll have kind of a limitless resource to real studio time um, to a certain degree. 
Um, you also find that the reason that the, there's more value in outboard gear is because you drop, let, let's just say you hit mid-range and you drop three grand on a gear, uh, it'll be outdated in five years. You, you may be able to get five years out of it. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You buy outboard gear, you're probably going to have it for the rest of your life. And it'll probably be resourceful for the rest of your life. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, most of the gear that they have there, um, you know, is within, I mean, to be honest with you, they've had within 10 years. Um, but a lot of the gear that, that is there was still purchased from pre-ownership from other people who had it for years prior. And, and that's the crazy part is that a lot of the in-the-box thing is to be fluid so you can do it anywhere at any time without a huge setup, which is fantastic because, believe me, I've sat at Starbucks and I've worked on projects all day. You know, and that's fun, you know, but when you compare that to using physical gear, a lot of times you just get more fluidity in terms of the sound because there's an openness to it because it's not bogging down on the DSP. And one of the things that you find is you'll, you'll run into, and this is a bounce out process, but you'll run into system errors that you may not catch on um, the initial bounce, but the more you hear it, all of a sudden you're hearing little things that shouldn't have been in the sound in the first place. Uh, whereas the plugins tend to uh, fail in certain systems and, and, and obviously process well in, in, in others, but, but not as well, not to 100%. The big thing with it is, is at our level, to be honest with you, at our level, things like effects, um, you could go get a fantastic effects processor for four or five hundred bucks, and, and it would be a dual to quad engine, meaning you can run four different voices of effects at one time. And with that, you're, you actually cut down DSP to almost half because of what, how much it takes to do delays and reverbs a lot of times in the box. And it doesn't take into account automation. And that's the next step. We did automation last week. You guys were all here for that. And automation essentially takes away a lot of DSP power. All that to say, all I'm really saying is that this is your means to get out of the box and not be stuck or isolated to just in the box plug-in processing. So, do you guys have questions? Did that answer your question, Jason? Yes. Uh, now, uh, as we move forward, uh, let's just keep going through this and then we'll start talking about the mix down. Uh, let's see. Um, Okay, uh, let's see. I have had questions about this, the target, the target window. When we actually go to a physical plugin, let's let's actually pull up a physical plugin, it doesn't matter what it is. I, oh, I do want to in emphasize this. When you go to your plugins list, if you made a stereo track, you will see the thing that says uh, multi-channel plugin. And all that really means is that the plugin itself starts as a stereo insert. So when you go down to this list and you see multi-channel plugin and then you see multi-mono plugin, the real big difference between the two is that the input of a multi-channel plugin is left and right. The input of this multi-mono plugin essentially is just a mono signal. The reason it gets listed as multi-mono is because it has to, in order for that stereo output to be resourced correctly, it has to pretend that there it's it's basically one mono for left, one mono for right, in order to do it correctly for anything that has um, actually differences between the stereo left and right side. And what essentially this does for you is multi-channel plugins carry one thing particularly that uh, valuable, um, and that is uh, a lot of times left and right independent outputs. So if you want to make certain adjustments to left and right independently inside of the plugin, multi-channel plugins are good for that. If you go multi-mono, you usually only have one control for output and they are not variable between left and right. But I will say this, multi-mono plugins are fantastic for uh, things like reverb when you only have, uh, let's say you have five vocals, okay? 
and you want to send all those vocals down a reverb, multi-mono is great for the input of a reverb because all those vocals, even though there are five of them, are all mono. And it's easier to send that mono information so that it goes down a mono into a mono plugin, and then it can be routed output in stereo. And that's what this is. Notice, I'm going to go to multi-channel. Notice all my outputs say stereo. You see that? If I go down to multi-mono, notice the difference. Uh, where is it? Oh, except my... Oh, I'm sorry. Let me put it here. Notice I end up with these mono to stereo options. And essentially what this shows is a mono input with a stereo output. Good for imaging, uh, things like reverb and delay, because we can use a single input and, and output in stereo. The, really, it's the resourceful way to take your vocal, which was a mono source, get it outputted into a stereo form, left and right. Does that make sense? So you actually have that pairing. Otherwise, if you send that output in mono, you actually kill the, uh, the overall sound field. Um, the sound field, essentially, if you were using your effects in a mono form, the sound field will always stay down the middle. Does that, does, do you kind of find where that's coming from? Now here's the downside to a lot of processing in terms of stereo versus mono. Downside to stereo versus mono is this. How many of you ever use loops? Okay, how many of you ever use sampling? Sampling, like anything out of Reason's engine, anything out of Fruity Loops engine, anything out of those, okay. In that category, there's good and there's bad. The good and the bad are things like drums, kick and snare, specifically. Those are not typically stereo recorded instruments. But they do require a stereo sound field in the reverb in order to feel like they're actually in a physical room. Does that make sense? Well, normally sampling gives you the option to do stereo for mostly everything. And the problem with stereo output is you'll find that there are a lot of instances where you have a stereo output on a source that was done in mono, which actually gives you stereo content that's identical on left and right. And when you have stereo content that's identical on left and right, what do you really have? Uh, not if they're identical. Oh, then you have minus three. Yeah. Well, you do have decreased de three decibel, uh, and that's actually, what's funny about that is that physically happens inside just the channel. So you would actually, the volume overall would be hotter because of it, just inside the channel, but you do have a mono, essentially, left and right, if they're the same, you end up with a mono source. Left and right, if they're at the same level and there's no difference in timing between the two, they're mono, essentially. The problem with it is, is a lot of people, when they set their, their uh, songs up or their mix down up, they see all this stereo imaging because of the fact that they have all these stereo samples. You get what I'm saying? If none of those stereo samples have any timing changes between the two of them, meaning none of them are riding with a delay or none of them are using reverb that is in a stereo form, and then you take your vocal, which is in mono, and, the, and they don't get panned out, essentially your entire mix is essentially a giant image of mono. Does that make sense? Even though everything is in stereo, it comes out as a giant image in mono, which gives you no sense of space, which gives you no sense of depth, uh, and it obviously gives it a very, uh, it will stay tight and uniform, but obviously you can have trouble mixing things so that there's, um, you feel like this is there and that is there, and you can independently hear the difference between those two things. And so that's where this really comes into play. I encourage you, only use mono effects, only use mono effects if your effects are going to be exclusive to mono instruments and they're going to be exclusive to, and, and I mean that uh, as an independent thing. So let's just say I'm making a vocoder, okay, for just one person's vocal, just one vocal, just one vocoder. I can make it mono because it's just one person, it's just one original mono source. It doesn't have to be stereo because it's just one thing, one thing, you see what I'm saying? Whereas if I'm vocoding several things, I probably do want that in stereo so that when those several things come down the pipe, 
unless I want them just blended off to the, a certain direction by themselves, like let's say I just wanted them hard pan left, and that's exactly where I want them and I don't want them anywhere else. If I want it like that, I can do it mono, but if I want to hear it anywhere left and right at the same time, then I need to write it stereo. Does that make sense? Because otherwise you're going to have to duplicate, and I've seen students do this, I'll be honest, I used to do this when I was younger. Otherwise you have to duplicate the effect track, and then you have to pan the effect track out. So you end up duplicating the effects, so you have two of them, in order to get two positions, because otherwise there's no way to do it unless you rock it so that it outfits in the stereo. Uh, moving on, any questions about that? Because that's, I mean, to be honest with you, that's huge. That's half the battle right there. That is, when you look at your overall session, one of the questions you ask is, what's my resolution sample rate wise, right? You go, okay, what's my sample rate setting in order to get frequency resolution? Then you look at it and go, well, what's my bit depth? Essentially dynamic resolution. And then you should go, well, how did I track things out in order to actually physically capture a stereo image? And on the flip side of this, um, on the flip side of this, if you have a lot of stereo image information, there are specific ways to set them up so they set, they're set apart from each other. But just so you know, there is left 100%, there's right 100%, and then there's zero, which is dead center. If you have two sources, uh, two separate sources, one rocking hard left, one rocking hard right, and then you add one other source and it's mono down the center. All you'll ever feel in terms of the stereo imaging is straight down the middle and two to the side. If you add two more sources, one hard left, one hard right, you'll still go down the middle, two to the side. What I'm getting at realistically is if you never fill 30% right, 30% left, 50% left, 50% right, what you're doing is you're missing the void in between and all you'll ever feel like because you're so hard left and so hard right essentially is straight down the middle. Because of the compounding, everybody's hard left and hard right. And that's another problem with sampling. When you get your samples, a lot of times, like let's say it's piano, where does piano end up in hard left, hard right? Do you got anybody do piano? Stereo? Piano? No? Um, well, in the, in the other classes, yeah, they have high and lows on different tracks. Yes. But left hand, right hand? Yes. Essentially, what it ends up happening is left hand, right hand. The problem with that is if you never invert anything you did on a piano or even keyboard, stereo image track, a lot of times, if you're not careful, your entire mix down will have left hand, right hand, and you could have put 10 different key sounds down, all of them going high hand, low hand. With this whole feel of high hand, low hand, you really miss the imaging that ends up in between. Does that make sense? Because there's, the only thing that accounts for high hand, low hand is the performance, and if the performance essentially has high, low variables in the in between, they're really just rocking the outsides. The only thing that then cuts through the middle is the vocal. But the problem with it is, is if you leave the vocal by itself down the middle, although you will hear it, it will sound like it's independent of the music. It'll sound like it's a little outside of what's going on with the music because of the fact that it's, it's built into this field that only has three real points, hard left, hard right, dead center. And that's really where making sure that the stereo verb and the stereo delay are set up. The other thing that you may have not heard yet in terms of stereo imaging, is that the most, the furthest outer point, it marks the outer boundaries of the stereo imaging. So when you're looking at a mix and you're going, man, I wish this would sound wider or bigger in terms of like a broader panning spectrum, one of the things you have to look at is who is on the farthest spectrum outside, left and right. And if everybody's on the farthest spectrum out, left, right, then there's no, uh, there's no relative motion for you to decide what feels wide or not, because essentially they're already all wide. The insides set the outer boundaries. And when we get into the finalization things, we're going to talk a little bit today about spatial imaging. That really gets defined with spatial imaging. Spatial imaging, essentially, that there are plugins that, that are, um, a lot of times they're just called imagers. And the imager sets or seeks to make your panning feel wider. And you know how it does it? 
Has anybody ever had one of these or used an imager? No, they're actually fantastic. Once you learn to use one, you'll probably never want to use anything else. Or you'll probably always use it at the final stage. The way that they actually work is they make the mix down feel wider, but in order to do it, all they do is they take the inside and they bring it in tighter. By bringing everything that's at 30% to 15%, meaning from here, instead of all the way out here, they, they, they took it from 30% here and they brought it in here, it made everything in the in-between stretch out wider. And it feels like instead of essentially tightening in the middle, it feels like it's going further than the outside. And all it's doing is shrinking the middle. Because a lot of times most people mix down real hard to the outside, but not really tight towards the inside. So that's kind of a huge deal in terms of this mixing process. But that's kind of what these are going down to. Now I want to point out, and the reason I wanted you to get one of these up, so grab any plug in, it doesn't matter what it is. Uh, what kind of tracks am I making? Uh, audio track, off track, it doesn't, doesn't really matter actually. I wanted to point something out in the plug-in area. Last week we had a blast. We did automation for plugins. You guys remember that? Okay. There's a couple of things information-wise that's important on on this uh, on this plugin um, uh, window. One of which I get a lot of questions about, um, but that is the little target. See this little target right here? Mm. This target is for when you're in hot key mode, there is a way to enter in Pro Tools so that all of your keys are physically all hot keys without hitting anything, without hitting an extra hot key button. Um, where if you hit P, P stands for something right away. If you hit L, L stands for something right away. A lot of engineers don't actually use this because you accidentally hit the keyboard and, and, uh, at all and all of a sudden all hell breaks loose, especially if you hit it with several keystrokes at one time because you're only one key away from making a change. But the other benefit of that, and on the 003 specifically, that target, that little red dot on the corner, specifically just says that as long as this window is open and as long as that target is lit, any change you make that is uh, in regards to a plug-in in a hot key motion or on a console, you can do it on here, you can do it on the SSL, you can do it on the matrix, you can do it on the icon systems, you can do it on the control 24s, the command 8s, uh, basically the venues, anything that's a Pro Tools controllable device, the, uh, the Euphonics um, uh, <coughs> controllers. If that's targeted, then that's the plugin that is in uh, the area that you will actually be able to manipulate from those hotkeys. That's the only thing it's there for. Not to be confused with key input. Okay? So if I ask you what's the target for, your response is essentially it is designating that this is the plugin that will be manipulated by either hotkeys or control surface information. Pretty simple, but it's just a little dot. Now the reason they made this the way that it is is um, in technically in the HD version of, of Pro Tools, they made it a long time ago so that you could have multiple plugin windows open at one time and you could essentially make an extra screen that just had nothing but the plugins in it. The problem was, is then you didn't know which one of those you're going to control if you make a hotkey change or if you make a control surface change because they were all up. And so that little dot was just to designate the difference between them. By default, this will always come up when you're in this particular mode uh, where you're doing the, uh, it's not LE anymore, but you're, not, you're in non-HD mode. But that is something that is particular information that the book wants to give you about the target. Um, other than that, most of what we needed to discuss in plugin world has been taken care of. I do want to make mention of a few more things. How many of you have already, oh, okay, actually, that's nobody, I'm sorry. Uh, no one's done, or is in, currently, Audio 275, is that correct? Right. What's the name of that hat? Surround sound. No. Now, in surround sound, um, in surround sound, you will work on, uh, you will be physically working on surround sound enabled tracks and surround sound enabled outputs. The reason the Inbox Pro, you, you actually just missed this when you came in. Um, and by the way, did you get the sign-in sheet? Um, uh, you, were you were you here when we were talking about the outputs? Oh, okay. 
The reason that the Inbox Pro, and I'm just going to flip the light on real quick. The reason that the Inbox Pro has six outputs is because it is now designed to, uh, at the base level of Pro Tools, this is the lowest break-in you can use for, for an interface. Well, yes, but you could do 5.1 mix downs. And because of the six outputs. Now, obviously, you can't do 7.1, but you can do 5.1, which is still probably the most popular output in terms of mix down. Um, but in regards to that, in regards to that type of mix down, I want to just show you and highlight panning options and how you get to panners and certain things about panning um, that are uh, enabled or offered. Um, to give you certain variables in your mix down process itself. Okay, so um, all I'm going to do for starters, last week we did this, um, you guys remember, might remember this in the edit window, but in the mix window you can see it very clearly. It's this little, little uh, fader icon. If you click it, you'll actually get this little window. And all this is, is this is just the exact fader you see here. It's just that it's giving you um, an option to have it be separate. So you can kind of have it be outside of your normal range so that if you wanted to get rid of your mix window, but you wanted to have the panner up for a specific channel, uh, you could still do it. So if we wanted to get rid of this entire window and we still wanted panner operations for, let's just say we had the bird, and we wanted panner uh, specific operations, we'd actually be able to jump in and, and actually get this. Actually, there we go. That way I can make changes to the parameters that are available here. Now notice it doesn't have a recording, uh, a record arming uh, system that is available here. It didn't have it on any of uh, these other tracks. So even all the audio tracks didn't have a record enable button. But again, you see the target. So that if we have multiples of these open, the target will be whoever's lit up. And then you see the, the panners themselves. Now, here's what I want to talk about. On here, they've added a couple of parameters. They've added, um, specifically, they're, what they're trying to do with Pro Tools is make the base model of Pro Tools. Well, it's not even the base model of Pro Tools. It's the intermediate model. There is an SE. There's an artist version that's out that's just for like, this, it's called the Songwriter Edition. It's like the, the break-in version of Pro Tools. Like, I think you only get maybe 24 tracks at the most. Um, and it's very simplistic. Um, way consu consumer level to the point that they sell it at Best Buy. Um, they probably started selling it at like Walmart now because it's just that way down on the, on the level. But with the intermediate level, what we know now is Pro Tools 9, what they've tried to do is give us as many options that, as we can that they do have in HD. In Pro Tools 7 and, and really below, and even in Pro Tools 8 some, but, but mostly 7 and below, my generation of Pro Tools learners on the LE, in order to get any HD functions at all, Beat Detective, which we talked about, we did last week, did not exist in LE, it was HD only. Video used to be HD only. This, some of the stuff that you're going to see here, has been HD only in the past. 5.1 used to be HD only. All that stuff, essentially, there. each time they do a release, they try to move more and more of the things that you can do in HD down into the more intermediate level. Um, and one of those factors is where you see it say safe. Safe essentially gives us the ability to keep our panners from being written uh, in terms of the automation or even adjusted in automation. So that if we accidentally get on the wrong channel and we didn't mean to move our panners, especially after we had fixed them, it would actually keep us from changing that. And that's what the safe feature is. But next to it, what I want to point out is this, and watch how this works. I have a stereo channel, and this used to be annoying because this used to not exist. Again, this used to be an HD only function for, for a while, but they've had it since I think Pro Tools 6 now. But when I was younger, this was our biggest beef. Notice, I want to pan my stereo channel. And I can't do it unless I have two, 
two hand well not even two hands I mean I need two I need two mice that I can click on this thing in order to do this at one time you see what I'm saying mm -hmm. so that really sucks and so what they did here is they gave us a link button which is this little two hoops hanging out here um, it looks like a little chain link thing with that activated it gives you the ability to link your panners so that they move in operation uh, in correlation with each other. Now, what it requires in order to link correctly is if you want to have them go identical to each other, you have to start them identical to each other, and then when you link them, they'll stay together. Hmm. Now, this used to be the hugest, I mean, biggest downside to stereo channels, because I don't know if you guys have ever messed with stereo channel panning and realized that because I'm stereo, I have a left and a right, and if I want it to be all left, I have to have left stay left and have right go left. If I want it to be all right, I have to say have right stay right and have left go all right. But if I want it center, not left and right center, but focused to center, I actually have to pan both ends to zero. But then what happens if I want to make effects that go back and forth? Like what happens if I want to automate this panning effect? How do I do that on here? And that's what this is. Now you have the ability, if you link them, to do this all day. Now, well, here's the other thing I want to show you while we're looking at this. This is the inverse pan button. And it gives you the ability to do the opposite. Now, inverse only really works if we start in the right position. And I want to tell you this, option, Option click on a fader does what? Raise your hand if you know. Raise your hand if you know and then set. All right, two, three, okay. No, yes, kinda? Yeah, <laughs> I'm thinking, right? Okay, go ahead, Royce. It brings it to um, zero. Zero, on the fader. Guess what option click does for the panner? Same. 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 <laughs> zero. Fantastic, because I don't know if you guys noticed, but sometimes when you're trying to hit the zero mark, Manually? It takes forever. It does take forever. And that's why it's there. So if I do inverse from here, notice my inverse essentially goes inverse the correct way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's where that option is. But I also want to mention we did plug in automation last week. You guys remember plug in automation? This also information, this all uh, information also resides in the in plugin sends. So if we go to a send in the mix down uh, in the mix window, I'm sorry, and we actually look at uh, let's create a stereo bus so you can see this. If I go stereo on my bus and I look at that stereo send, the stereo send it'll still technically. Uh, oops, sorry. Sorry, I need a stereo send on a stereo track. There we go. Stereo send on a stereo track, which you will encounter quite a bit. You actually see the same controls. Link. Save. And then, of course, you have your pre-fader and then your follow main pans, which wipe them out and follow your main panners. But again, these are really important if you want to actually have your stuff roll together. Now I've seen, and you might end up wanting to do soup. Right now you might not be thinking, well, uh, when am I ever going to use that or, you know, blah, blah, blah. A lot of times I've seen uh, instances where you want to take the dry, non-affected sound source on stereo pair of channels. You want to make the dry version be more over here, and you want to make the effects version be more over here. And then, gosh, once you do that, especially with the client, I'll warn you this, you ever do something cool effects-wise with a client in the room, they're going to ask you to do it again and again and again and again. And that's fine, as long as you understand how to do it. So um, a lot of times you, you do something like that, they're going to say, wow, well, what happens if every half note or quarter note, you invert who's on what side? And that's where this whole linking really comes into play, because when you write the automation, you're going to want them to go back and forth, back and forth. Does that make sense? The cool part about linking, in automation, I do want to show you this. If I go down here in my, in my track view selector so I can see the physical automation and I go to my panners, notice I have a pan left and a pan right. Huge pain in the butt. 
Because what that means is if I manually want to write it, then I have to actually go, I could do it with a pencil or break, uh, break points with the grabber tool, but if I want to write that on both sides, I have to physically go and do it for both sides. But if I have their automation set to read and I have them linked, essentially one will override the other and it will carry on the motion. And that's beautiful about that because before you had to go and every time copy paste on both sides. Huge pain. Which doesn't seem like a big deal now when you're just doing it once, but when you're doing it over the course of an entire session, it's just been, you know, that's two times the work. Any questions on that so far? I mean, that's all pretty cool, easy to look at. Now let's look at this. I'm just gonna show this to you once. You will do this in surround sound, but if we, and notice there had been this option all along, but if we had um, go, gone to uh, Command Shift N and we created a new, any one of these way down here, um, 5.1, let's just say 5.1 audio track, when you open that panner, you're going to see uh, this kind of breakdown where there's no panning information. And so you bring in a plugin that will actually give you the ability to do it. And it's, that's what all this is. You insert a plugin, multi channel plugin, go down, sound field, any one of these 5.1 options. Uh, let's see, I think this is the easy one. And essentially, it will give you the information for panners either inside the plugin, uh, or of course, if you route the output. Uh, let's see, we could go. I'm just going to create an extra output just to give it us this option. And um, you don't have to do this because it will really change your whole setup if you do. Then you end up with this bad boy. And essentially what this is, is this is the big breakdown of a 5.1 that utilizes the same thing, linking, center points, but it incorporates the use of left, right, center, surround left, surround right. And then the sub is just this lo uh, low frequency uh, enhancement, which is LFE. That's the sub right there. And you actually get to move the panners all the way in, inside of the entire field. Yeah. And um, that's pretty much it for panners. Any questions there? Okay, we did sins. Are there painting specialists, like someone whose job is solely working on painting? Um, well, um, I'll say yes, uh, because of the fact that the reason I say yes is because they're technically, they would fall into the category of surround sound mixers. Because when you are a surround sound mixer, for the most part, when you go into the surround sound class, you should get a chance to do a project in surround where you actually decide what goes where. But what you'll see is as a surround sound mixer, by the time it gets to surround, um, all the voice editing cues will be set in stems. They'll already be processed. They'll already be stem. They'll already be mixed. They'll just be in stems that these are the dialogue information. This is the music information. These are the subsets of uh, explosions and things like that. And so all they do from there essentially is they don't have to sit around and do the full mix down of you know, all the frequency manipulation of everything. A lot of that's already been done. The scores already been laid out. All they have to do is position them. So essentially, yes, 
It's just that on top of their duties of doing this, they still do a little bit more, but a lot of times the surround mi sound mixer is not the guy that tracked any of it in the first place. Like he usually didn't do any of it in terms of tracking. A lot of times it's just handed over and he just does it. But you might turn around and then do tracking and the next day for something totally different. Yeah. Or he might, or or he might have, end up having to do um, uh, uh, mix downs in, from surround back to stereo, or he might end up having to do some processing. For the most part, though, he, you know, he could be tracking depending on his job type. But for the most part, those guys they do this all day be, because they need specialists that are good at the field in the field of perspective. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and perspective. It's good and it's bad. Notice that you, if, when you go and watch a movie, the problem with it is, is you watch a movie in the theater, if it's surround DTS, if it's 7.1, uh, they have they have 9.1, uh, but if, uh, if it goes into those formats, when it gets burned on the Blu-ray, a lot of times it has stereo, it has um, the virtual center, so left, right, yeah, essentially, and there's like four or five different stereo versions, or uh, surround versions, and with those, the, the engineer still has to do all of those uh, mock-ups of essentially the, the whole, the one, this is the one for theaters, this is the one for the trailer, which is just stereo left, right, you know, this is the one for, and, and you'll notice, I don't know if you've ever gone in and watched, trailers will jump back and forth between being partially surround to being just left and right and they usually don't go all the way to the back because they're not set up for that type of surround type of system for the most part. So when the main feature comes on it still utilizes more sound implementation than some of the trailers do. But those guys still have to do so many different versions of them that it, it's a job in itself to just be the guy that is essentially doing the surround sound mixing because there's so many versions of it. And it, unfortunately they don't have Seven to one doesn't just resolve down by itself. Does that make sense? Like if, if a seven to one would just went, oh, I'm on a five five one system, so I'm just going to knock off the last two. If it did that, you'd be missing information because obviously the two extra take extra information. And if you did a five point one two, and I actually I saw Mission Impossible's trailer sounding like they did a five one two a stereo mix down, and they didn't um, re they didn't repan it. They just there is a way to make this get mixed down to just a stereo pair without having to mess with it. And the problem with it is, is if you took all your time spreading things out amongst all these channels and then you slam them into just left and right, if you don't position them correctly, it sounds really muddy and uh, anticlimactic, you know, because of the fact that all the surround things that were happening are no longer happening. So all that was just taken out of it. And now it's just right here. And nothing's going anywhere between the left and the right. It's just kind of hanging out, and, and it, it it gets real dull. Um, so yeah, I mean, yes. Can you answer your question? Yes. Yes. This would be a, this would be a blast of a job to have. But at the same time, they don't. I mean, to be honest with you, they get paid an average amount of money because at the same time, it's not the hardest job in the world. Uh, it's more conceptual. It's more um, you get a reputation for doing it. But there, I mean, there's only a, a handful of guys that, on a on a professional level, are the go-to for big movies, and those are the guys that get paid well. While well, all the other guys that do this, essentially, they just have. I mean, really, this is how they rock it. They just set up joysticks, and here's this track, put it in its place. Here's this track, put it in its place. It's really not nearly as intense as the guys that are doing the film scoring tracking, or the film scoring mix down or the dialogue mixed down, you know what I'm saying, or the special effects. So, so it's kind of one of those things where depending on what you're in it for, you know, kind of. Just something to do, really. It's fantastic. Well, it's fantastic in terms of, I, I, I've had the most fun doing this, but at the same time, it's again, it's still one of those things that, you know, it's, an all, it's a 60 hour a week at least, 60 if not 80 hour a week kind of deal, where you usually get paid a, a reasonable amount. Obviously better than, Parking cars, you know, right. you know, better than doing that kind of thing, but but not in terms of the big picture in the audio world. Right. You could still there's still room to grow from there. Um, now, uh, let's take a look at um, the idea of submasters. It begins on page uh, 356. I just want to point out a couple things.
we had this conversation last week. I don't know if you guys remember our conversation last week. Um, we had uh, uh, quite a few things to talk about last week, but um, we had a conversation about who does what and when we do what with who and all that fun stuff about submasters and those groupings themselves. You guys remember that conversation? We were talking about if you make a movement, if you don't end up doing at the at the highest level, you know, if you have let's say the 808 involved in the drop and you and you have it externally from the submaster, if it's not in a submaster or submix, then it goes all the way through so that it doesn't kill any things that are happening in the music levels. And so with that conversation in mind, I want to build some submasters so you can see what they would look like, so you could understand what they would look like, and you could understand how they would be utilized. And then when we go into working with some of the mixed down project stuff that we're going to do today, you'll actually physically get to see them in action and begin to, to build them yourself. Now, here's the thing. Let's talk about this. Uh, I got a question before you get into it. Uh, yes, sir. How often do people use submasters? All the time. All the time? All the time. Every session? Pretty much. I'll, I'll, I'll pretty much at least once. Purpose for it is um, you go to odds on. Submastering doesn't get look doesn't we don't even call it submastering. We call it um, there's no name for it to be honest with you. It, well, the reason there's no name for it in that in that format is we uh, there we have uh, seventy I think it's like seventy two channels max that we can get from Pro Tools to the board. And one of the sessions that we work on in Audio 265 is something like 96 tracks. Obviously there's a problem there because we can only get so many of them to the board. So what we do is anything that's a duplicate or a, an extra layer of something that's like a background vocal, like there's a couple of stems that are like, um, like we have 12 versions of the alto background vocal, the mid-range background vocal, doing the same part over and over and over and over and over. So each one of them are identical. So instead of calling it submixing, which is what we will do here, all we do with that is we route them all to the same output, a stereo output, uh, and split up half so every other goes to one side and every other goes to the other side, and they come down two channels, essentially submixing. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, submasters, essentially. Beautiful for that because now all of them, instead of having to say, well, this is the priority one and this one will get SSL uh, essentially processing, all of them get it and they all sound really tight and uniform together. Great example. Um, background vocals are, are, how many of you have ever done background vocals or recorded background vocals or mixed down background vocals or ever worked with background vocals? Okay, if you haven't yet, background vocals are probably one of those things that really enhances a performance period. It could be ad-libs, it could be haze, it could be woo-hoos, it could be whatever it is. It could be actual harmonizing, but whatever it is, the, the, the good and the bad. Let's talk good and bad. The biggest size of background vocal you'll ever try to get is a giant choir sound, okay? How do you how how do you get it in the real world is how you essentially try to get it in the studio. How do you get a choir sound like a choir in the real world? Anybody? Uh, Center, alto, you yeah, have a whole bunch of people. Okay, parts and you have a whole bunch of people, you stand them up uh, on different levels and kind of like a yeah a smiling face shape. Yeah. Yeah. Now he's getting technical in terms of the physical and you're getting technical in terms of the pitch. The, the same is true in the studio. Most of what you hear that sounds like a choir or most of what you hear that sounds like a group of people, it's either done in one of two ways. One, it is a physical choir. The reason that most people opt to do a physical choir is because it takes way less time, to be honest with you. The, the reason that people also opt not to do a physical choir is because they want it to sound better. And the good and the bad of a choir is in a choir, you guys know, if you've ever sang in a choir, there are people that don't sound great. And in, in, in the studio, I've seen large format choirs that they brought in the choir and they're like, okay, you're going to sit this one down, and you're going to sit this one down, and, you're gonna, and then they essentially get down to 20 people that work. Right. And then they mic it up and they make it work. Well, let's say you try to do group vocals in a choir format with four people. Okay? or even one person, but let's just take it to four, something moderate. In order to get the sound that you would have been looking for, in terms of the physical, you just have to layer them out, and then you have to layer them out so that there's a feeling of, they all did it at the same time, so timing obviously, they all did it in the same room, so obviously a, a level balance of togetherness, does that make sense? And then of course the individual parts, you know, and, and, and the parts have to be laid out to a certain degree. 
But the real beauty of that is, is if you stack it like that, guess what you have? You have no bleed from any other person that you don't want to have control over. And I've done the worst case, probably you're, one of those things you'll eventually do, children's choir, because those are the worst. Um, children's choirs, those, some of the kids know how to sing, some of the kids don't. They don't ever go, oh, you can't sing because you suck. You know, it's kids, you know, so they're always like, well, just keep, you know, eh, and it just gets crazy. But there's always that one person that, even though you have four mics spread out and they're all over here, there's this one kid that he's on every mic and no matter what you do, you can't get him off of it. You know? He's just that loud. Does that make sense? So in the control version where you used four, now, if they're accurate, let's say we just said, all right, four of you, we're going to have you know, one sing bass, one sing tenor, one sing alto, one sing soprano. Let's keep layering you as you go. Let's, let's, let's layer your parts as you go. Well, now you get this ultimate control. So you want more bass? If you, if you recorded just bass on that track, you just push more bass. And, it, and if it's groups of bass, you submix them. So when you come down to it, you get to compress them. So if any version of the bass was ever done incorrectly, louder at some parts or softer at some parts with the idea of compression in mind, we kind of squash the sound so it's nice and consistent. So all of a sudden that bass sounds like it's a group of people, you know, and essentially in, in a good form. So then you could go submix bass, tenor, alto, soprano, and then after you're done submixing them all individually, which might have been, you could add 20 tracks of each part, right? So, you know, 20 by four, you know, do the math, we're in 80 tracks already, just these four parts. Well, we take these four parts and submix them down to one stereo submix of the choir sound. We then get to compress or limit from there, EQ from there, so we have the entire graph for each individual thing, reverb on, on the submaster instead of reverb on the individuals, because that because we want it to sound like they're in the same room, right? You see what I'm saying? And and that is a fantastic example of trying to go big on something that you only have enough people to do to do certain parts for, and submastering works really well. And the reason for group vocal submastering works pretty well and, and is very, very important is because a lot of times Dialogue and okay. dialogue and vocals in particular. Vocals fluctuate a lot. A lot more than you'll ever get fluctuations out of kick and snare. A lot more fluctuations than you'll ever get out of guitar or bass. Piano fluctuates quite a bit because that's how it's played for the most part. But vocals, because they fluctuate. If you stack fluctuating vocals and you say, hey, let's make 10 tracks of the same parts, kind of. And they may be layered or they may be a couple different parts. They'll still end up doing this. See what I'm saying? And because of all this going on, it really, if they're not compressed together, you see what I'm saying? If they're not compressed together and built to move in one uniform way, they really kind of tend to, to uh, really not get in the way. I'll say this, they don't get in the way because if you're a smart enough engineer, you never turn them up loud enough to get in the way. But by not getting in the way, you'll also realize that their low moments, you don't hear. You know what I mean? Like. Off, you're, they're supposed to be in at this part, but you really don't hear them as well as you hear them at this part. And of course, that, that's the whole idea of compression, right? But compressing them together will make sure that if any one of them jumps out of order in terms of volume, they all, they get, you see what I'm saying? They all, they all get checked. Yes, exa exactly. Or if any one of them gets too quiet at a section we need them beefed up, all, all, obviously the makeup game will take care of the rest of them, essentially. So we're trying to do it in a uniform way so we kind of get that sound. Now that's at a very easy level to think about because vocals are um, vocals are a, a cool thing in terms of processing because I'll tell you this, you'll be hard pressed to find a vocal that sounds bad on a recording, if, uh, not based upon performance, but based upon tonal qualities and, and equalization. Meaning most vocal mics, how many of you own a vocal mic of any sort? Most of you, right? Most vocal mics are tailored and graphed so that when you sing on it, it's already kind of EQ curved to be focused on getting a good sound. You put that into something like Pro Tools, mix it down a little bit, you already have a good vocal sound. So vocals are easy to talk about because for the most part, vocals are easy to lump together, throw a compressor on, do a quick graph, bada bing. Now when you start talking about submixes for the band, or different parts of the band, like drums. Now you have to be really careful about who gets involved in the submix, you know, who who gets EQ'd in what stage. And this is really what I, before you had asked your question, this is really what I'm getting into. Did that answer you, by the way? Mm -hmm. well, um, 
what I really want to get into is um, submixing has a certain level of complexity, but it's really simple. Okay, the concept behind the submix is based upon what content is in the mix down itself. And this is the stuff, to be honest with you, this is the stuff that you should, uh, this is the stuff you should lie awake thinking about the night before you jump into a mix down session. You know, I mean, you, you, you're really already planning. You know what I'm saying? You're planning who, who gets to be in what group together. Not, not mixing groups, essentially. You're not editing groups. Submixing. Who can we submix together? Who gets to ride together? Now you could, uh, and this again, uh, the reason we started at the beginning of this class, I told you guys there is no um, formula for mix down that essentially says do this and do this at this level because no two sessions are alike. Right? You guys remember that? Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about how the sessions are, how sessions are different from one from another. And that takes us to how we plan the concept for subjects. If I have this, if I have vocal, acoustic guitar, and piano, I won't need a submix. There's no purpose for it. Because the tracks, the track list that I'm using is so small that none of them really can be grouped together to be mixed down in a group. You see what I'm saying? They all essentially get mixed down as a whole, and, and they can be balanced off of each, of each other. But because I don't, I don't really have a stacking of vocals, and I don't have a stacking of things that go with the guitar, and I don't necessarily have a stacking of things that go with the piano, submixing really will get in the way. Submixing would be an extra step that I wouldn't even need to use. You see that in this particular juncture? If I did, on the other hand, this, and I added this plus live strings, and let's say those live strings were like, um, well, I'll just say four times each part. Four times violin, viola, uh, well, let's just say cello, and we won't, we'll leave out the bass. If we do this, now we need a submix for strings. Now, here's the kicker with this whole thing. Just because you need one submix does not mean you need two. So, if I look at this and I submix the strings, I don't need to submix everything else separately so I have two submixes, and then I'm balancing out between the two of them. I could if I wanted to in order to get balance, but for the most part, all I'm going to do is submix the strings and do the mix down with everybody and bring in the strings, right? But the strings need a sense of EQ for all of them, so all of them have the same sound, or, or they all have a balanced sound overall. They will all need some sort of compression to be able to bring in their, their sound so it's somewhat uniform. Uh, they'll probably need a reverb all in as a whole, not necessarily just independent parts. You, you kind of see where I'm going with this? So when you have a large uh, uh, set of something, it's a good time to submix. In one of the sessions we were looking, in the Goodbye Tonight session, actually, what I did when I did my submixing is I said, okay, I, did a sub, I originally did a submix for drums. I originally then did a submix for one set of guitars that sounded had had a sound a lot like each other. So they're really the rhythm guitars that had a more chunky sound. They got a submix because particularly there were I think three, three of them rocking stereo channels. They all came at different. Some of them were overlapping, but a lot of them were on different tracks because of the fact that they would overlap and they would hand off to the next part. They couldn't necessarily reside on all the same tracks. And that, what it would do for me is that would make it so that whole, that three sets of stereo tracks had one submaster for it on that guitar, and all I did with it is I added one EQ. I didn't bother compressing that at that level. All I did was put an EQ on it that made the rhythm guitar have an EQ curve all around. Does that make sense? 
put one EQ on it so each one of them gets the same identical EQ group. Then I jump to the next set of guitars that were the brighter leads and I set an EQ curve for them. Does that make sense? So essentially I just took those groups and I said, well you have this sound and I want you to have this sound in the end result. So I put you together in a sub mix. Okay, yes? I have a question. Now before, <coughs> before you do a sub mix, uh, wouldn't you want to get your guitar or like whatever you're sub mixing at that sound that you wanted, the exact sound, like if you wanted to EQ it before it went into the sub mix? No, not necessarily. Or you would just... Now that's a good, now here, let's look at this, because that's a really good question. There's a couple of variables that are, in, that are, um, there's a couple of variables that have to get included, okay? And let's, let's jump out of guitars just for a second. And let's go back to voices, because this might give an outline for what you're saying. There is independent stuff that needs to be done for certain things. And let's just say, let's say we all sang a line of a song, okay? And it had us all involved in a sub mix. I would want us to all sound uniformly alike, and I can do that by putting an overall graph on us. But if you look at the individuals that are in this room, and you think about their voices, you think there's probably characteristics of each and every one of your voices that are unique to you that can be good, but maybe there's some unique characteristics that might not be the greatest. Maybe, let's just say, okay, let's just say, for instance, some of the girls are a little too bright. You see what I'm saying? They're just, they're, their voices are a little too bright and they need a little depth. On the sub-mix level, I don't want to add it there because if I add depth there, I add it to everybody. If I add low and there warmth, I, I add it to everybody. So I go add it to an individual, and maybe I have a guy that has too much low end because it's taking up too much of the mid-range, so I have to take it out, you know what I mean? And so I take that out of the individual. So I fix that and I resolve it at the individual level, but when I get to the sub-mix level, I still do an EQ here in order to make everything of it have a mastery EQ so I can just go, all right, now I've got them all in the same place. And a lot of times when you start before the submix, which is a great question, before I get to the submix, as long as they're all relatively somewhat in the same place, more than likely at a vocal level, that's probably very mid-focus. So when I get to my EQ that I place on my sub, my submix essentially, I'll say, okay, if it's too much mid, at that EQ, let's take out some mid, Let's bring in some more high overall. If I brought in high before taking it out of the female, it would have annoyed me because I would have brought out a lot of female yeah. high. But if I took it out individually and then I bring the high back, everybody gets some high. See what I'm saying? Yeah. And then I can build the contour so that everybody kind of gets contoured into this thing. And then essentially it's all, all done. For guitars, a lot of times, the reason I might not have to do that is if the guitars are all recorded and they sound the same, then I can suck mix them on one EQ and not have to do anything different to any one of them. But if any one of them sounds like it stands out kind of weird, the fix of it is just go in and EQ that one independently so it sounds like the others, if I want it to, depending on what I'm going for. And then I can sub-mix it into that EQ and it will sound even more uniform than like the other ones as well. The other thing though about this is that when we talked automation, do you guys remember why we talked about automation before in terms of sub-mixing? Do you guys remember that? Why did we talk about automation? How, how automation and sub-mixing, we talked about it last week. Automation and submixing, what's the problem? Volume wise. Do you guys remember that at all? Oh, uh, what you what you use on the submixer, okay. It yeah. would it would affect the parameters or the values of automation, whatever you're automating it. Yeah, so essentially if if I automate at the base level, if I if we all sang and I automated certain ones of you and I had a limiter on my submix. Depending on what those automation outcomes are, we'll change the overall outcome of the submix limiter because now a new volume is being introduced into the submix. So what I like to do a lot of times is save all my automation for the actual submix track. Does that make sense? So if I wanted to take all of us and we had a group vocal and I wanted to fade us in and fade us out, if I had a limiter on that track, I don't want to do it at your independent level because it'll affect how the limiting takes place. If I do it on the submix level, it'll only do it in the sub. It'll sound the same limited up and down. That's a hard concept to get across to people, to be honest with you, um, because of the fact that. Uh, oh, okay. Here we go. Give you an example. You're still with me, right? You're still kind of hanging. Give you an example. We just compressed this kick, okay? And this kick sounds nice and fat and punchy, right? And let's say we did it through a sub mix. Uh, sometimes I'll sub mix kick if I had like. Let's say I had a, um, 
a session where I had three kicks rolling at the same time in order to get this one all encompassing kick sound. Sometimes I'll submix that because I don't want to have to deal with, you know, uh, when, I, when I look at the balance and when I look at the overall kick sound, I'd rather have one EQ that gives me my overall kick sound for my EQ wise. I might EQ them independently, and then once I fix it and do my submix EQ, then I'm like, oh, I just want a little more high overall, so I put up the submix a little, right? You guys follow me there so far, right? Now, as soon as I fade out at the end of the song, and that kick's going boom, 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 boom. If I fade out, and I fade out at the individual level, and I have a compressor that was making that thing punch, as it's fading out, because that compressor's not hitting the threshold, that it's supposed to be to activate the compression anymore as it's fading out on the individual levels, it comes back to my and then the end of my song goes ping. And so what I had compressed, which was boom, boom, boom. That ensures if I do it at the submix level, it ensures that when it fades out, it's going. It's still getting power all the way down the bottom. Which means if you were to take your speakers, I don't know if you've ever done this on a fade out and keep turning them up when it's fading out to hear what's going on as it's fading, you still get the same level of aggressiveness on the way down. And that's huge, that's really important. Now, what was your question, do you have another one? Yeah, um, what if, like, say we were doing a mix of an all vocal mix, and on one part, one of the girls got too high, we already had a sub mix, she got too high, and all we needed to do was just turn her down a little bit with automation. But we can't automate it at the bottom because it might affect the compressor. How will we get her to... You'll have to... Down? Well, there's two ways to do it. You could automate the compressor. And that automation on the compressor level... Well, okay, there's two... Depends on the category that it falls under. If she's too loud while other things are going on. Yeah. You could automate the submaster volume. The, the, master, the, the submaster volume itself. Yeah. If she got too loud while other things are going on, while other things are going on, you can automate in a negative direction as long as something underneath it's continuing. Does that make sense? So let's just say, because here's, here's a great, I mean, it's just kind of hard to imagine this, but let's just say um, we're all singing, okay? And we're all breaching the threshold of a limiter. But one person's singing too loud. I can automate them as long as we all continue to sing and breach the threshold. Okay. I can automate that person back down to kind of where we are. But if we're not all singing and that person was really loud breaching the threshold, but if I automate it and it falls below the threshold and the compression basically stops or it goes too minimally, then that's when I have a problem. So you're kind of having to look at it. It's situational based upon what's going on. And that's why automation is so quirky because you'll run into situations where all of us are singing and we're breaching the threshold, that one person needs to be faded down, and then all of a sudden we all stop singing, and that one person falls underneath the threshold, and you have to automate it back up just to breach the threshold just to apply the compressor. So it does get a little quirky. So not to say it's not, not to say, I mean, it's not as easy as it sounds, but it is fairly easy if you're <coughs> okay. One of the things I want to remind you of is this. Remember that the reason why, it, the reason why it will always supersede the how, remember that? The reason why we'll always supersede the hat. So the reason why you want to do a submix in the first place is to create uniformity. Does that make sense? It'll always supersede the how because whatever it takes to do that in a submix is fair game, just to be honest with you. Whatever it takes to maintain that is fair game. So you're going to find in certain situations, I'll be on, okay, here you go. Great, great example. I did a song with uh, a gospel group years ago. And they brought in all these girls to do these parts, and we didn't have any guys. And I was like, this is, this is cool, but the girls, the, I mean, to be honest with you, the girls had, everything they did with the S's and the T's was very And what's cool about guys is it's, it, it, with guys, it's a little more subtle for guys. With girls, it's, because that's their frequency range, you start using a de -esser, and you guys have used de -essers, right? I mean, for the most part, I can talk about it a little more elaborately if you haven't. The de -esser essentially, all it does is it picks a frequency and it says, this is where the S or the T is, and it brings it down. It only compresses that frequency level at that port, part in time so that the S and the T gets a little more variable, it gets rounded off. Well, with the female, if they're singing near that frequency range and, all, and they're doing then not only is it compressing the S and the T, but it's also getting rid of some of what they're seeing. You see what I'm saying? That causes a problem. So what we had to do 
is we had to, we were like, okay, we need this to sound the same level going through, right? So, so it feels like it doesn't skip a beat, but we also need it to not sound annoying. And we need to not really take away too much, but we need to figure out how to do this. So what we did, what we did is um, me and the, the songwriter of the, of the overall session, he was the lead singer of the group. It was a guy with a bunch of girls, essentially, and that's kind of, it, 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 it balanced out really well when we finished. It just made a few complications because of the differences. So what we did is we automated all the girls so that at the end of every phrase that had an S or a T, instead of using DSing because it was killing our overall sound, we just automated little teeny DB bumps downward and we would release them as soon as they cleared. And what we did in their place, so every time they hit an S or a T, it faded out. What we did in their place is we, me and the other guy, we kind of set it up so that he, he we kind of worked it out. He could sing a low range subtly to get some of the S's and the T's, and then he'd sing the octave up in the female range, and all he would do instead of singing the line is he would just go do the ends of the phrase. So he'd just sing the S, and he'd just sing the T, or anything that closed with the T sound, and then all we did is mix it together, and when you listen to it, you're like, um, and because the lead was also happening at the same time, you're listening to it going, you didn't even know the difference. Like you, you could almost not tell that there was any change taking place because you went in and we just put it in there. And all that really stands to say is sometimes you're going to have to find a workaround that doesn't necessarily fit the means of the how. It really doesn't necessarily, it kind of has to go, you kind of have to think outside the box. But the why was the reason. The why was every time we hit the end of the phrase, it was like, uh, uh, and it was just like, holy cow, there's so many S's right now that we just can't do this. It's just not working. You know, if we DS it all, it sounds like they have a lisp, and all you're hearing is and that's the opposite of the, the DS form. So, you know, you're, if you understand the why, you'll understand the how. That's this is really what it comes down to the concept. So when you're looking at a mix down, how many of you have anything that you're mixing on right now? Or anything that you're kind of working on? Okay, when you approach your mixes, Good thing to do is look at it and say, okay, now I don't want to overcomplicate my life, but because of the idea that a submix will a lot of times, if I apply a compressor and an EQ, it'll gel things together, it'll give me the ability to manipulate things as a whole. Do you see what I'm saying? And so what what conceptually can you look at and say that is valid to use as, as something inside of a submix? The downside to submixing, there is a downside. And this comes back to kind of what we were talking about a little bit. Um, they have now what's known as delay compensation built into Pro Tools 9. Delay compensation gives you the ability to calculate, and it shows it down at the bottom of the mix channel. If you're using a lot of plugins, it'll say how much delay is being applied because of the plugin. Well, if you mix down analog, your delay is invariably so small that you don't have a problem with it for the most part. But if you mix down with plugins, the problem is, is, let's say a channel goes through EQ, it goes through um, compression, then it gets bust down to another channel, it goes through EQ, it goes through compression, it's got all these things going on. By the time it gets outside of all the processing stages that it went through and all the way down to the output, it tends to be slightly delayed from its original starting position. And that's where delay compensation really comes into place. Uh, because of the fact that that little bit of delay, if you spread that out over all of your tracks, begins to be something that's so different one from another that if you submix essentially too many levels down, like like if you were to say, hey, I made a submix for the snare, and then I made that submix go to the submix for the kit, and then I made that submix go to the submix for the band, essentially that's too many levels down to the point where you begin to have enough delay to cause problems. Does that make sense? Because it's just taking too long for it to get to the output. Essentially, you're trying to get it to the output in a fairly reasonable time. Does that make sense? Questions about that? Did you have a question? No, I was thinking about uh, inception, how they keep getting like, a level deeper. Yeah. And every time it gets a level deeper, it's like more complicated. And, like, and, it's, and it's slower. It takes, it's slower. It, yeah, every, yeah, exactly. There it, it takes longer. It, Whatever, how it works out. <laughs> it's like a second. It's like a second now equals so many hours down at that next level. I think I just need to see that movie. There you go. Well, anyway, so that essentially is what submixing is. Now, in order to make submixing happen, 
Submixing has a couple of different forms, but form number one essentially is to mix it down to a, uh, an aux input. Some students of mine have had questions, and it's okay. I'm just going to point this out because I know trial and error. So I've had students go, I tried to submix to master faders and it didn't work. Well, I'll tell you the fact of the matter is, is that master faders will only be activated for outputs. So if you're using more than two of your outputs, those master faders will work, will work all day. So if you're, like, if you had the 003, you can get up to 18 outputs, meaning essentially if they were all stereo, you could have up to nine master faders. Well, the problem with that is, is when you do a bounce down, and you do your bounce out, that bounce only gets to have one output option. So it'll only pick one of your stereo pairs, which is why by default, stereo pair A1 and A2 are your stereo pair left, right, mix out. That's your stereo mix. Does that make sense? So you really wouldn't want a, another set of master faders because that would mean you'd be sending to A3 and 4, which is not part of your mix. Do you kind of follow me there? That means you'd send to external outputs that have nothing to do with the mix down, which will never end up in your bounce. The only real reason that that might be beneficial is, again, 5.1, because you would actually set, set it up to say, well, the first two are left right, the second two are center sub, last two are left surround, right surround. That might be the only option where you might do that and have six outputs being used at one time. Other than that, for the most part, you won't utilize it in that fashion. Now, when you get to odds on, you'll utilize it in a larger scope where every channel will have an output assigned to it, and that those outputs will literally be linked to the console. So when channel one says output one, it goes to channel one on the board. Channel two says output two, it goes to channel two on the board, all the way up to channel 72. 72 will go, you know, you see what I'm saying? Seven, channel 72's output will go all the way to channel 72 on the board. And those will go one for one in that, in that system, but they don't require separate master faders because they literally go right off of the channel, or right off the individual track output, right into the console. That'll be explained when it comes to you. Um, let me show you some submixing and, of course, the wonderful world of, of back to the Y, right? Submixing, I'll be honest, submixing is the only, the only warning I'll give you for submixing. You okay? Did you have a question? The only warning I give for submixing is this. Don't overlook parameters that may need to be mixed down at an individual track level with submixing. Because the problem with submixing is it does make you... If you use it too much, it can make you lazy. Meaning you could go and say, oh, well, I'm going to put a, an EQ and a compressor on my 20 vocals, but overlook the fact that they still haven't been balanced individually, or they still haven't been panned out correctly, or they still haven't, some of them still need EQ uh, fixes. Um, great example, the reason I give vocals as an example is because everybody's nasal properties, essentially, are different. And those nasal properties make the real difference between high mid frequencies and how well they're produced. Which of course means that you probably have to add an EQ for people who are more nasally than others. You know, you know what I'm saying? And, and vice versa. And now if you even take that idea and say, well what mic am I using? What mics did I use across the board? That might take another purpose for why you might need to change some graphs on an individual basis. And it doesn't even take into account, and this is submixing. Remember our 3 dB headroom loss, our negative 3 dB? Problem is we add, we lose negative 3 dB, or we lose that 3 dB. You guys know, know what I'm talking about? Okay, if you don't, if, you, if I've been mentioning this the whole time and you didn't know what I was talking about, you should have learned this in 125. All it basically says, and I, I actually, um, there's a huge, calculated formula for this. It'll probably, it would, it's a formula that would, that would probably take you about a minute and a half you know, with a calculator. Put in the numbers, input the numbers, input the numbers, input the numbers, input the numbers, blah, 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 divided by the speed of sound. And then you compound all this information, square roots of certain things, and bada bing, you get a physical number. What it's essentially saying is if you take two volumes, let's say each one of you talked into a mic at the same volume, okay? As soon as we add one, set a sound to the next. It doesn't mean that the output is double the volume. It means that when the equation finally comes down to it, about an average of 3 dB, the combined two of you make an average of 3 dB more than, than your volume. So if you guys were at 90 dB, if you were talking to 90 dB and you were talking to 90 dB and we put you together, 
you, it, you will equal roughly 93 dB. Now, there's a re reason there's an equation for that because it's not exact. It's not exactly 3. And the reason there's an equation for that is what if you were at 80 dB and what if you were at 90 dB? That would definitely not be near 3. It would be a physical number that would be somewhere in between, you know, that would give that variable information. And it gets worse if it was 80, 90, 72, 45, 102, and you added all those together, all of a sudden there's a lot of variables that are taking place, which is why it's an equation that gets used. But overall, if you're close, you lose 3 dB. What that really means is, if we add all of you up, right? If all of you get added into Pro Tools at the same volume, we just lost 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18 dB of headroom. And what that really means is the master volume, which is why I always encourage you to make a master fader once you have more than two tracks, that master volume has to be turned down to compensate for it. Otherwise, if we did no master fader and we maximized your output so that it hit in a nice little yellowish orange, and everybody's, we did the same thing when we tracked, we'd already be clipping on the output, which means if we bounced it, it would come out as fuzz. So that's what that negative 3 dB talks about. So that essentially means for each track we add, we've got to bring the master fader down. Now, what, I'm, what I want to mention in this is this. That is at the overall volume level. And if you have other classes with me, you'll have a fantastic time talking about frequency manipulation and uh, compression, how it works with the overall, because that's, it's something that I like to talk about because most people really, it's the next level of thinking. When you see a meter move here, it's a representation of the overall sound volume, right? It has no analysis for individual frequency volume. You see what I'm saying? There's no physical thing on the meter that shows you, oh, this is 1K's volume, and this is 20 Hertz's volume, and this is 10K's volume. You see what I'm saying? There's no, it's only showing you the overall volume. So that's why the, why the ears are so important. Well, if we did vocals and we put a whole bunch of vocals together, what's the vocal range focus? Uh, Frequency-wise. 20, 20. Well, 20 and 20K is the human hearing range. What's, this, what's the so vocal like range? 1,000 and 2,000, right? right. Well, it's... Yeah, it's, more, it's realistically more... Um, I mean, I'll tell you this. It technically is more like 200 to somewhere in the 10K range. And where it's really fairly strong, and you'll notice the difference because as soon as you do a, a, a high pass and you start rolling up past 200, it starts to get real thin. 500 is really dominant, 1K is really dominant, 4K is really dominant. Real dominant portions of it. But notice it's all in the mids. See what I'm saying? Because of that, if you stack a whole bunch of them, what do you get in terms of the negative three factor? Oh, who, who's, okay. Yes. And who loses the most headroom frequency wise is mid more than anything else. And what that really means is when we go to a submix on something, sometimes you have to ask yourself, well, I just did 10 tracks of so-and-so. Because I know what their, what their dominant frequency is, it's more than likely because I added all those together that I'm probably going to have to EQ first thing on the submix is EQ out a certain degree of that in order to make it less focused on that frequency. Does that make sense? You're essentially counteracting the fact that you just threw in a whole bunch of those. Do you follow me on that? Yeah. And, and it's the same thing with guitars, it's the same thing with strings, it's the same thing with drums. I mean, it's the same thing with all those things. You start compounding tracks on top of tracks or layers on top of layers, you find the frequencies that are dominant and essentially you have to make them a little more subtle so they don't stick out. What you'll never realize until you, I, I'll tell you this, you, you won't realize it and, until you really stop to think about it. What's your favorite instrument? When you listen to a song, say it. Well, when I listen to a song these days, yeah, synth bass. Synth bass. Okay. What's your favorite instrument? Drums. Okay. What about you? Vocals will count. Anybody? Vocals is their favorite thing. Yeah. So well, some people, that's how they are. My wife's the same way. I can be like, yeah, I think anybody can sing. Not anybody can get great drums. Not anybody can get great, you know, certain. Some sounds are hard to get. Let's just be honest. Vocals are, are fairly easy because they're at a good range. So I usually appreciate great kick and snare. I mean, I know it sounds silly, but, but sometimes when I hear great kick and snare, I'm, I'm excited. I hear a lot of not great kick and snare, to be honest with you. I hear a lot of okay kick and snare. But I want you to think about your favorite instrument. And next time you get a chance, and you listen to a song, 
Listen for that favorite instrument, like you probably do, and ask yourself, is that favorite instrument any louder than any of the other instruments that are going on? Because the thing about it is, is a lot of times you key into your favorite instrument, you listen for it, and you listen to it, and you listen to the qualities. I listen to kick and snare all day, but I can tell you, there's, I don't have very many songs in my car that are just kick and snare songs. Like, there's all sorts of stuff going on, but all I really listen to is kick and snare, you see what I'm saying? So when you go to mix down, you'll find that the things that you like the most, unfortunately, tend to get pushed hotter, and you really need to, to get used to the idea of settling them into the fact that no one's going to be any more dominant than anybody else. Oh, hold on. Just conceptually, uh, like a mother favors their children over someone else, uh, isn't that just going to be natural? Yes. And okay. So, uh, it's not okay, but it's natural. By this guy who likes synth bass, you know what? You're going to hear a little bit louder of synth bass. Well, you better, you'll... You better freaking deal with it. You might not like it, but oh well. You're dealing with it. Well, but it's not, but it's not the, the fact that if you're mixing somebody else's music, it's not what you want to hear, it's what they want to hear. That's the problem. That's the problem. That's really where it gets into that because and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I I really like guitar. So my stuff, I like more guitar. Most people don't like more guitar. You know what I mean? So that's kind of the balance of it. And, and the cool part is, is on your own stuff, you get to really give it that focus. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean, and here's the thing, it doesn't mean that that doesn't happen. What it does mean is it doesn't happen to the degree that it, it, it convolutes the ability to hear everything else. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so what I'm really basically saying is now if you think about that idea and you think about your favorite instrument and if you did a project, how many layers of that instrument or how, you know, how much of that instrument might you incorporate? Because of the layering and the submixed portion of it, you'd have to be really careful to look at that and say, Okay, that item, because it's frequency dominant in these areas, may need to be EQ'd to a point where it's a little more subtle in terms of the equalization or frequency properties, specifically. So if your thing is drums, obviously there's some things that have to be balanced out there. No one wants to hear drums all day. You know, I mean, no one wants to hear certain things all day. Vocals are different. Vocals, I had this conversation, I had an epiphany, like six months ago, I had an epiphany. My epiphany was, the real reason, you guys know what the Haas effect is, right? The Haas effect? Haas effect, right? Yeah. Explain it to me. Uh, okay. Specifically, it's an easy number. The number is? Nine, nine, nine. No. That's not <laughs> 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 Okay, Haas effect essentially says, inside of 30 milliseconds, the human hearing does not actually recognize delay. 30 milliseconds. 30 milliseconds, so your human ears don't recognize delay. What that basically means is they, uh, it's not that they don't hear delay, it's that they don't hear delay. It's selective hearing. You know, it's that whole thing. You have a friend that talks to you all. My little sister, Gabber, you know. Um, so I have great selective hearing with that particular situation. It's the same way in terms of delay, because it would be annoying if you, your ears heard every little delay that was possible. Well, I had an epiphany because I was trying to get this point across to my class, and they're like, well, but how come I can hear 30 milliseconds on delay when I'm listening to it in the studio? And I'm like, well, you can hear it, but can you hear it? Can you separate in, you know, the initial source from the delay and, and literally find its positioning inside of 30 milliseconds? Well, it gets complicated, but the epiphany really is this. The real reason that the Haas effect works in real life is because typically, when you listen in real life, the only thing that's important to you is the information that's coming to your ears. The information. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Information in a song format looks like sounds, right? Or is heard like sounds, sounds, and then a physical dialogue lyrically. You see what I'm saying? Whereas in spoken conversation, the sounds really don't matter. How often in a spoken conversation are you analyzing someone's voice frequency contour? You see what I'm saying? You don't really pay attention to their frequency contour. I mean, unless it was like James Earl Jones showed up, and then you might realize, oh, he's got a deep voice. But for the most part, you don't analyze for frequency when you're having a conversation. Correct? I mean, you may. Do you analyze for delay or reverb when you're having a conversation? 
I think of the last time you ever sat there and I'm like, there's a lot of reverb in our conversation. You see what I'm saying? What's your key and most important factor in a conversation? The information. Information. And the information supersedes the, the need to analyze the actual audio. Now, once that information gets disjointed and that disjointment takes place where if Jason was telling me something, I care about the information because he's in the room and he's actually having a conversation with me. But if Jason were to have recorded a song with his voice on it, I'm not worried about the information because he's not there in front of me trying to, to deliver information that I need to, to hear. Like I need to understand what he said in order to give him a response. All I need to do from an audio perspective is I'm just listening to it and I'm analyzing not what he's saying, but I'm analyzing the frequencies that are involved because he doesn't need me to respond. You see what I'm saying? Like, because I don't need to know what he said, I need to know the contours of what's going on. It totally changes the game, and that's why you're so, physically, there's a lot of analytics that take place when you get on the other side of headphones or when you get on the other side of speakers compared to when you're in the room. And I don't know if you've ever had this opportunity, but if you've ever been with a vocalist in the room while they're tracking vocals, a lot of times you're listening and you're hearing them, but you have no idea what they sound like outside of the mix because you're not in the mix. You see what I'm saying? You just hear them, and you're like, well, that sounded really good, right? Mm -hmm. But I couldn't tell you what that sounded like in, con in the context of the song until you're in the song. And so that kind of changes the game plan and what the focus is. So what I want to point out is submixing. You can very easily shortchange your submix by throwing a, what I call a, a, a blanket over the whole thing and saying, oh, let's just fix contours, let's add some compression and call it in. If you don't get down to the details of who's doing what and where and what the frequency compounds are. When you get into the principles of acoustics and you start dealing with acoustics, you start talking about bass buildup. Bass buildup essentially is this concept that if bass is not controlled in a room and it doesn't have anywhere to go, it tends to build up towards the corners and the walls and it gives an unnatural response, which is why you've probably been told, if you're setting up your mix station, don't put it all the way close to the wall. If you're setting up your speakers, don't put it all the way up into the corner because of the buildup, right? Well, if you think about that, on a mix down, if you don't physically actually contour certain things that will compound and create buildups in certain frequency areas, you'll get an unnatural response overall from the curve that may have a more dominant set of frequencies in one area than another. That essentially is why, and it's a brilliant thing if you think about it, that is why a drum set is not just a kick. That's why a drum set is not just a snare. And that's why drum sets incorporate cymbals, because they carry up the upper echelon of the range in order to fill out that overall sound. You can't go wrong, for the most part, if you had a kick, a snare, and some sort of hats or shakers, you just fill low end, right? See what I'm saying? Low end, low mid, the punch of the mid, and the highs, all in one, all in one giant thing with just a drum set. Which is why if you have an acoustic guitar and a vocal, it sounds way different than if you had an acoustic guitar and a vocal, a drum set, and a bass player. You see what I'm saying? Because all of a sudden the frequency range just expounded. All right, so let's look at this before we take a break. Uh, or did I already get past it? Oh, I did. Dang. All right, let's look at this when we come back. It is 7.35. We are going to come back.